Hi, welcome to Go on the Run. And this is part two of section 23, GRPC, and we're looking at GRPC Service Basic. Now, in the previous video, um, part one, we look at the basics of using the Go context package. And we'll see as we write gRPC service in this video, as we write a gRPC service in this video, you can see where that come in handy. But today, I want to jump into writing a gRPC service itself, a basic service. But before we actually look at any code or the specification or anything like that, I want to sort of illustrate for you what it is like, and then we go from there. So we use some foundational knowledge. Now, if you remember, when we talk about and we look at protobuffer in the previous section, section 22, and we're talking about encoding, we look at protobuffer as a form of encoding. And one of the things that we looked at was this idea that you could write a profile, which has the description of that buffer um, that you want to use or the messages that you want to encode. And you fed it to a protobuf compiler and it spits out a bunch of implementation in different language, language implementation. You can start using the code immediately to encode messages. And we did exactly that. I also showed you um, this slide, which is, I said, if you had imagined having a set of application written in a number of languages, now you can use um, protobuffer message to allow communication between these different applications because now if you have a transport layer, because we know that how protobuf generates the interface or files that you call, to encode the messages and decode the messages, you don't really have to think about it or worry that the message was encoded in Ruby or in Go or Dart. Once it's hit the wire, it comes to you, you can be able to read that message or you can encode a message and send it. And this was all about protobuffer and encoding messages. Now, if we go to gRPC service and we say, what is a gRPC service? It sort of takes what we're doing with protobuffer messages and opted now to not just messages, but how to describe a service and the set of messages or uh, remote procedures or the procedures you can call on that service. So that's the gRPC. And gRPC there is a recursive acronym that simply means gRPC remote procedure call. Like it literally means that, right? Um, I sort of mentioned this before, that is one of those recursive acronym like PHP, PHP Hypertext Processor, um, Hypertext Processor. Um, Perl is something similar, GNU is GNU is not Unix, that sort of thing. Um, so here we go, um, gRPC is gRPC Remote Procedure Call, and that's what you're doing. You're describing a service that allows you to call procedures that are exposed on that service remotely right so that is exactly what we're going to do and where we're going to start is we're going to start with describing our service using the protobuf format right or protobuffer format and we'll feed that to a grpc compiler and don't worry we'll see how to do that just remember get the idea for us of what is going on and then we'll look at the details um, so this is looking at the forest versus the trees right we're not looking at details just looking at the big picture and then once you feed your service description, your gRPC service description to the gRPC server um, compiler, sorry, it spits out a number of um, a code for a, um, a number of language for which you can implement your service. And of course, since it's a remote procedure service that you're describing, you can also call from these other languages. So you can stay within the Go world and have a server gRPC service written in Go and have another Go application that calls that gRPC service and you'll see it or we'll get code spit out for both of those. But you can ask that, you know what, I want you to spit out code for Go and C++ and then you now go and implement, let's say the server in C++ and the client in Go or whatever nonsense or combination of that you wanna do. Now, I not notice I mentioned something just now, that what you get from the gRPC compiler is client library, always. You get the client library, and it does this for about 20 or 10 or something languages, maybe 10, not 20, 10 languages, and 
that means that oh, if somebody have a gRPC service somewhere, there's a good chance that oh, whatever language you program in, you're going to be able to get the client library using that proto buffer file to be able to call their service. All right, that's what a client library is. And just like when we were doing proto buff, where the code was generated and you did not have to do anything other than use it, the client library is exactly the same way in the gRPC world. You simply have to just you get a full implementation on the client side to just be able to call that service. I will see exactly how that is, of course, in code. The second thing you get is server stub. Now, this is called a stub because it's sort of a placeholder or just a little bit or enough to get you started to write the gRPC service. So gRPC code is going to take care of all the heavy lifting of how to encode your messages or your function calls rather, right? The remote procedures that you're exposing, how do you... Um, uh, accept those calls from a client and of course the client library is going to take a, know how to take um, your request for this remote procedure call and encode it in such a way they can send it to the gRPC server and the gRPC server then you know processes that message and the function call or a procedure call and then the result from that how it goes back to the client is all handled for you but you will be right in the server. Now, the reason I put a asterisk there is because, well, let's say you can have client library for about 10 languages. You're going to have the, um, the only generate server stub for a subset of those languages. And that's because in some of these languages, you probably don't want to write a server anyway. So, for example, JavaScript, you're going to be able to get um, client library to be can call gRPC service, um, a gRPC service from JavaScript but you're not going to get server stub to be able to implement a gRPC service in JavaScript. Okay, that's an example. All right. So I have this page with reference, a um, bunch of links and so on when we look at protobuf. It's essentially the same page. I just added the one extra link at the bottom there for gRPC, and I'll go to that um, website now and sort of go through some of the interesting bits before we jump into the code. So here we are at the grpc.io website. And as you can see, it says a high performance, open source, universal remote procedure call framework. And there's a nice big arrow pointing down to getting started. And if you look at why grpc, well, it tells you grpc is a modern open source, high performance RPC framework that can run in any environment. It can efficiently connect services in and across data centers with pluggable support for load balancing, tracing, health checking, and authentication. It is also applicable in last mile of distributing computing to connected device, mobile application, and browser to backend services. So what this really means is if you imagine that oh, you have something that's running in a web browser, like I say, you can use gRPC from JavaScript, and that can connect to some gRPC server that's working, running as an API front end or something like that. You can use the API front end and to call gRPC backend services. You can use it on a mobile phone, for example, to call those same API front end, all this other stuff, right? And of course, it has all this other stuff like load balancing, tracing, health checking, and authentication, right? All that stuff sort of built in. And so these are some of the benefits, right? Simple service definition. Now, if some of you have been around as long as I've been, You've seen stuff like Corba and SOAP, and they, those things were used um, for a while, but they never really quite took off widely because people, um, they were too verbose. Um, like, for example, um, there was um, SOAP that uses XML format, and um, it was just very verbose and very complex. Try describing your service in XML. It was just too much. And, even somebody like me who loved this sort of thing and distributed computing, I just quickly gave up on it. Um, Corba was more like C++ based and again, very, very difficult. Um, then there was um, our RMI, Remote Methods Invocation for Java. And that too was just something that was Java specific. It didn't cover any other language really. And so while GA and I would be able to call native C, C++ code, RMI, the remote procedure part of it, was just for Java, and it was really not how you can call Java code, code implemented in Java, or use Java code to call anything else, right? So um, it was very Java-centric. 
Um, it's only until we really got around to doing something like gRPC that we have this thing that can run pretty much anywhere. It cover a number of languages. Um, and so I talked about that already. Cover is worked across many, um, you know, language platforms and uh, languages and platform. And like I said, um, you get this automatically generated code for the client. And of course, you get service stuff so that you can start implementing right away. You will see, we'll get to see that in code. Um, there's bidirectional communication, which is with the streaming thing. And we're going to look at this around part, uh, maybe part three or four. Well, we'll see where we land and we'll talk about bidirectional communication streaming. Okay. And so we can look at who's using it, but we don't really care. Um, so in terms of getting started, um, this page covers a lot about the concepts in gRPC. Now we sort of know uh, quite a bit already because we did proto buffs. So if you look here, let's skip this first part and you look here, message, hello, request, string, there's a type, message, and ID. This is, this part is exactly what we have done already in proto buff. And like I said, gRPC reuses the same proto buff file. The only thing that's new here is this part that describes a service because when we did um, protobuf, it was all about how to encode and decode messages, describing messages that can be encoded and decoded in a certain format that was efficient. Now, for transport or for saving, as a matter of fact, it wouldn't really matter. But here we have this extra piece that allows us to now describe a service. And again, it's a very simple thing. Like you see, message, start with the word message. Service, start with the word service. Um, name for that service, name for the message. And then within here, these are the fields for the message and it has a type here. This is the procedures you want to call RPC, the remote procedure call to me. It couldn't be any simpler than this. And this is the name of the procedure that the service is going to expose. And this is the parameter or the input to that service. And then it returns. It always returns something. If your procedure doesn't return anything, you could just say empty message. And there's built-in empty message, but you can just do a simple empty message, like quite literally define a message that has no field. That's an empty message. And that can be a message that you return. If it doesn't accept a message, same thing. Just give it an empty message as the message for the input and the return. Now, here is the important thing that's different in gRPC than maybe what you might be accustomed to when you write a function or procedure in um, that is not remote, a remote um, invocation. You can have multiple parameters, input parameters, and in Go, you can have a function that returns multiple values. In gRPC, it simply restricts you to one message as input and one message as return. So if you have some really complicated thing where you need to return multiple values, just wrap them up in multiple messages, right? So that's the way you deal with something like that. All right. So, all right. So I think we're set there that's sort of enough for just that little um a little peek as to what is coming oh uh, you can read all this stuff the service definition right like many grpc system grpc is based around the idea of defining a service specifying the methods that can be called that can be called remotely with their parameters and return types by default grpc uses proto buffers as the interface definition language the idea that i mentioned for describing both the service interface and the structure of the payload messages. It is possible to use other alternatives if desired. We're not going to use others. To me, proto buffer is pretty simple. All right. Um, so other things that okay, we'll talk a little bit about authentication much later, probably in like part five or six. But the other thing that you want to um, really spend some time on is on these guides. So just as I showed before, you're going to be able to have a service that's implemented using GR, a gRPC service implemented in one language. And then you're going to be able to call that service using some client code that um, you use to implement your client. And you don't have to worry about implementing any of this detail, um, the implementation detail here. Um, gRPC takes care of these dark dots. So your client simply call the client library that's generated here, which is to me is more like a proxy than a stub. Um, and the proxy relate your request to the gRPC server 
which does all the decode and everything of that request and let your code know about it. Your code does what it's supposed to do with that request. And then that's encoded back and sent back to the client and the client gets that as if it was a local method call. All right. So you will want to go to this quick start section and go to the language of your choice um, that you want to work with or environment. In this case, Android is not a language, but an environment or platform. And so for example, for us in Go, you want to go click on that Go link and make sure that uh, you have the, you meet the minimum requirements. So here it says it require Go version 1.6 or higher. And you can type that to make sure that uh, you have the correct version. May I have probably one of the latest version, which is Go 1.12.9. Um, so I met that requirement. You also want to install gRPC package. You don't have to do this because once you're using Go module, it will install this for you um, once while you're coding, but you know, might as well just run that and have that install. But that's more for writing the Go code. It doesn't give you any binary really that you can use. And you will want to have the plugin. The plugin is that compiler, the gRPC compiler that I mentioned. Since it uses protobuf, they already have the protobuf compiler. So the protobuf compiler will take care of encoding your protobuf file and the messaging part, right? The structure of those input and output, the messages. And the gRPC plugin will take care of how to encode the service part of it. And so what happened is you actually invoke the proto, um, protobuf compiler and tell it that you want to use a certain plugin and you specify which plugin you want to use, whether you want to use a Go plugin, C++ plugin, or whatever. So you need to install the plugin appropriate for your language. I'm going to keep, I'm going to repeat this. Protobuffer by itself, even though we're using a protobuffer file, protobuffer by itself does not know how to generate code for gRPC service, those stubs and whatever else, right? So you need the plugin. So absolutely install this. I have it installed already, but I'll install it yet again. This is important having the, the, this plugin. And if you don't have this plugin installed, when you try to, to invoke it, when I show you how to invoke it, it will complain and tell you, oh, it can't find this file in your path. This, uh, go, this proto C dash gen dash go. Okay. So now that you have that in your path somewhere, uh, we're not going to worry about the examples. Instead, what we'll do is jump straight into our, um, example code. Now, if you want to be able to, generate code for other languages by all means go ahead follow along and make sure you have all these things installed for i did this one for java um go ahead do it make sure you you're able to um build the java you need to have this in your path um there are a number of ways you can go about doing the java thing but whatever if this is your environment then you should go through the headache of setting it up now someone asked about if i can do um, C++ and gRPC, uh, well, protobuf encoded message. Well, the answer is I actually looked into it. Now, I used to program in C and C++ a while back. And one of the reasons I move away from those languages is because, quite, quite frankly, um, when I think about doing a project, I don't want the tool or the language to get in my way. And I want to get down to start trying to solve the problem. And just trying to get... C++ um, set up on my system and all the things that I had to install and da 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 it was just a headache. Um, I haven't been doing C and C++ in a while and maybe that's why I don't have my system set up for it. But, um, you know, this Basil, I don't know what this is, but it's like some new build system. I don't know what it is. I used to use Make and CMake back in the days, but still I couldn't use that today. But I really do not have the time to go and fool around with just getting this stuff to work just so I can show, you know, one example. Um, so I'm sorry that how I'm not programming the CC plus space now to be able to help you, but it was just too much work for me to get that going. On the other hand, I was able to do the Java setup fairly easy. So um, I might show that. I, I'm working with Dart because I'm doing Flutter. So I'm going to go through whatever headache that is to get the Dart and it looked like it's pretty straightforward. Um, and so I, people want to see Dart and Java, maybe, well, Dart especially I'll be doing, but Java possibly, but C plus, unfortunately, just too much work for me to get that working. 
and I frankly do not have the time to spend on it. And um, since I'm not actually doing any C++ work, it's not to my benefit. Um, so I would recommend that you just sort of go through this quick start guide and there's a tutorial here. You go through um, the C++ tutorial. That's the only thing I could recommend. Okay, enough talking, let's get down to it. So here I am in my going wrong directory. And so you can see those are all our sessions that we have sections that we've worked on or we have coming up. And so I want to go into 23 GRPC and we have several parts. Now part two should be an empty directory. And so I start my Visual Studio Code editor here, for example. And let's fire this up and let me open up this guy a bit so we can see what's going on. Okay, so here's part two, it's empty. And so one of the first things I wanna start with is of course is exercise one. We'll just start from scratch. We're not gonna reuse anything that we've done yet. Um, and then of course I wanna go to that module file. So go mod and I'll call this module my awesome service, okay? So that's what we're gonna have call this. My awesome AWE awesome service. So we'll keep it mass for short. <laughs> it's not a great name, but oh well, it works. All right. Um, the next thing I wanna do is just as we did before, I wanna have a directory for our model, okay? Model, not module. I wanna have a directory for our model. And of course I'll put a file there and let's call it messages that proto that we do in proto buffer uh that's not let me rename this proto messages that proto all right and we know that when we're using proto buffer when we're using um proto buffer file we have to say syntax is equals to proto 3 for example we have to say that we use in proto buffer syntax 3 else it's going to default to 2 and proto buffer syntax 3 is much simpler than 2 so definitely in my recommendation you should just use that we have package let's call it model now if we don't specify this package and say model then it's going to use like the file name so it's going to be like messages as our um you know package directory pa package name but that would totally be messing with the actual name that we have in this directory so let's just keep them the same that makes things easier in the land of go and let's say we want to do a message called mat request. Okay, so it's probably time I stop and see what is it our service is going to do. So I want to do a simple calculator service if you want to think of it that way. A service that running somewhere out there and you can send and ask it to do basic math calculation for you. You can say here, here are two numbers, add them. Here are two numbers, divide them. Here are two numbers, multiply them. Here are two numbers, um, you know, subtract them. Um, so very simple math service. And you can imagine that um, I want to make this a service because the device or where I'm going to run this from, I don't have the capability of doing math for whatever reason, right? I don't have the ability to do simple math. So I wanted these two numbers to be um, computed and I can send them after the server. The server is going to do the work for me and bring and send back the results. Okay. So my math request is going to encapsulate my two numbers that I want to send for this operation. So we're doing binary operation. And so I'll make them in 64. I mean, it's probably way bigger than we need to make them, but why not? And I'll call it operand one. And of course we have to say message one. And we have the same thing and we can say message operand two, and this is message two. And this is the simple message we're gonna send from the client to the backend as well, as the parameter for whatever service we're gonna report uh, remote procedure call or procedure we're gonna invoke, we're gonna send this message and say, you know, add and pass in this as a parameter, and we'll expect to get a response, and that response should be our mat response, right? And so that is just going to be an in64, uh, 64, and it's going to be the result. And here we can say um, message, this is field one also. So, okay, so what, what does our service look like? Well, our service, like we said, we wanna, to create a gRPC service, you just use the service keyword and let's call it my AWS or my awesome service, right? Let's just call it. Now I could have called it my calculator service or math service, for example, would have been um, a 
a way to go also. So, uh, but I'll leave it since I use my, um, um, since I use AWS, yeah, my awesome service in my module file, I'll keep this as my awesome service. Well, actually, let me change the name here. Uh, so let's call it my math service. And let's probably go back here and change it to my math service. Sure, why not? All right, so let's do that. Okay, so my mat service. So this is my service. Right now, it does not have any procedure defined. So we know as uh, this mat service, like I said, we want to do something as simple as add. So if I had to write this as a method, it would look like add, with, which takes the parameter mat request, and then it returns mat response, right? So this is how you, you'd write that. So return mat response. All right, and I can do it like this. No, there's another way you can specify this. You can also do like this, um, but I don't like doing it that way because it, while it makes this look like if it's a procedure, it also make it look like if there's something should be implemented in here. And while that is sort of true, we're never gonna specify that here. So um, I rather make it look like, or you might write an interface. No, the only thing that's missing here is we have to say this is an RPC. This is the name of the procedure we wanna call. This is the parameter to the procedure, and this procedure returns this um, message, and the parameter being a message, so, and the return value being a message, and that's all. Now let's go and see how we how we compile this. So I will go to my command line here, and so let's go to part two, and let's go into exercise one directory, and so there we are. We see this. Now if you remember. When we use the proto C compiler, which we install, we say proto C and we can say minus minus go, right? The language you want out, we'll say equal. And this is the directory in which I want my result to be written. So if we put that here, it means the current directory, but I want it to go into the model directory, right? I want the go code to go in the model directory. And then the file that we want to compile. So the file I want to compile is in the model directory and it's called messages.proto. If I run this, as you could see, no error, and it generated this file for me. Uh, man, where is this? Da -da -da -da. So actually it created a nested directory, which is not what I want. So I wanted to go to the current directory, but since it's read it from this model directory, it created back in that same directory. So let me delete that and run it again. Bam. So let's start off with our messages and I'll rerun this. And there we go. So I say I wanted to go into the, that directory, which you would think it means the current directory, but no, the fact that it read this file from this model directory, put it back in that model directory. And so there's our go.proto file. And it's nothing different than what we've seen before. If I take a look at the outline, well, you can ignore all the other stuff that's there, but basically you have this request and struct, and then those guys um, described, you know, the fields, right? They don't have any other method attached to them except for reset string and things that allow you to access these fields. But this we've seen before. The things the marshal and all this other stuff get to the operand set and set to operand, right? We've seen this before. So at this point, there's nothing new. And if you don't believe me, you can take a look on the side of my screener. There's nothing in here, I'll show you why in a minute, about the service, right? If we look look for math service, like if I'm here and I do search and I look for service, there's nothing, no result, right? So there's nothing here but service because the protocol C compiler does not know how to, even though it's reading this file, it doesn't see this as an error. It simply doesn't know what to do with it and it ignores it. Okay, now before I show you how to generate the gRPC stub and so on, I wanna show you one other thing. I can say that oh, my messages are in this directory and I can specify minus I for say include this directory and people who know um, but C++ and the C compiler, this is gonna be familiar, minus I for include directory. And I can say it's in the model directory. And since I'm saying you should look in this um, model directory for stuff, then I simply just have to specify the file name. And so now when I run this, 
I get this. And so it went into the it from this messages that proto in the models directory. And because now my output is dot, now it writes it locally um, here. But I don't actually want that to be here. Messages that go. I still want it to be. This is gonna be a little confusing, huh? I still want it to be in the model directory, the output to be in model. I just saw the proto buffer um, compiler, like if it you get specify the full path to the file, then it will put it back to that path. But if you say include, then it knows where to go look for that file, but then it writes it to the output directory that you specify. So it's sort of weird. So anyway, so this gives me the result that I want, right? So this sort of thing. All right, so this works and nothing here has changed. So far, we have not invoked the proto gen C. So the thing that we want is proto go um, gen go, I think it's called, right? This guy is what we want to invoke to be able to generate proto buffer um, the, th the message for us, the service description. And so the way you do that is you say minus minus go out equals to plug ins equals to grpc. So you're specifically saying, I want proto buffer. I want you to invoke a plugin. What kind of plugin it is the plugin that's called grpc for the Go language? And but I still want you to write the output to this location, right? So the output still goes there. And so now when you run this, and if you keep your eyes over here, and we'll look at the code in a bit. But if I run this now, you'll see it runs successfully, and it says that I was deleted because I was looking at the wrong file. But here we go. As you can see, there's more stuff that was added to the bottom here. And if you scroll down, well, before we scroll down, you'll see, first of all, there's grpc included. There's context, which we didn't have to use before, but that's why we did it before um, in the previous um, video. All this other stuff in the previous part looks the same, but when you scroll past here, now you have thing about context, and grpc version and you have this thing like my mat service client and it looked like if there's a struct there's an interface defined that has you know this add method but this is the client side which means something the client can call there's an implementation it looked like there's a struct and then there's a function that's attached to this struct right there's the implementation of this interface and we don't need to worry about the details i'm just showing you there are more stuff then there's a server and then on the server side you have also an interface and this is unimplemented method but that's okay because we have to implement this interface right as our service all right and as you can see my mat service server is the server api for the mat service service that's because i use service in the name so what does the implementation of that look like? Let's create another example. So I think that's enough to get us to the point to say, we know how to define a gRPC service and we know how to generate the client code and the service stub. I'm saying service stub because I see stub as a placeholder, something that has to be filled in, whereas they're using stub to mean something that you can call in place of something else. I would have said a proxy instead, um, client proxy. but let it be how it is and we'll just simply copy this and then we'll paste it back part two we'll paste it we'll call this exercise two i'm going a bit slow let me close all these things to make sure that we're using the right stuff and so we already have the service generated um, let's go up and then down to exercise two directory now we want to be able to implement a client let's start with a client client is easy to implement I think we can implement the client that doesn't have anything to call but we should get it to the point that when we call something we should see like an error message or something to that effect and so let's do that so how are we gonna do it we have our client directory let's do main that go for our client and then we want to of course do package main and then function, you know, main usual thing. All right, so we have that much going for us. Now, remember what I said, we want to be able to call our gRPC generates 
the client side, what they call in stub that we need to call for the service. Now, when we look at this file just now, if we look at the outline, we'll see it all. There was a my mat client as a type that was interface though, but there was this new mat client here function that you can call apparently to get a client. And if you call it, you'll see this function, you call it, you give it a client connection, a gRPC client connection, and it gives you a new mat client. And that client is what you will then be able to use to, um, you know, call the this function because that's what's implemented. So I think what we should do is copy this, go back to our code, and we can say that, uh, oh, by the way, let me show you one way to cheat. You go to the model directory and you do doc, go doc, and you can see it says package model, and this is how you import it. MMS, which is our module, by the way, MMS, is not mass anymore, it's MMS slash module. So we import this, and these are the things that are exposed to us. The new Mac service client, and then we can get back a reference to a Mac service um, interface, right? So object that implements that interface. And then for that object, we can call, so if we do this again, and then we say, well, what is it that we can call, right? So what is this thing then? When we get back this, what is it really? And if I paste this and I enter, you can see that it tells you you can call this at function, right? So let's do it. Um, so we want to be able to call this, I'll copy this. So let's see if it's gonna import it for us automatically. If I say model that, and then I paste this, um, and I save, does it import it? Yes, it does. That's nice. So this imports this. And so what does this give us? It gives us a new Mat client object. So let's call this our client, right? And this is what we're gonna use to invoke um, the add method. This is missing a connection, right? We don't know what a connection quite yet is, but we have to create a connection and pass it here, gRPC connection. But at least we know that once we have a client, we can actually call it, right? So we can call add on um, client stub. Let's use client stub, right? So this client that, and then this should give us the add function, and there you go. If we call that, we see that we need a context. Well, we know what a context is. We played with that before. And what do we need to pass in? We need to pass in a model request. Well, makes sense. That's the requirement for it. And this optional thing. Well, we'll deal with the optional stuff later. Um, important thing is that we know that how we need a CTX, which is the context, and we know to create that. So we can say context, that background, for example, is a simple context. And for in, well, that is just a pointer to a model that uh, request. So that's that. And what are the parameters here? It's operand one, let's call it, let's say four uh, or 11, whatever, it doesn't really matter. And operand two, let's say that's four, right? So let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of that. And since we, for now, we don't care about um, call options, uh, let's just remove that. And so we're going to, that's a very other parameter anyway. So that's that. Or at function returns what? It returns two things, the response and the error. Well, that's, that's our result and an error. Those are the two things that it re returns. And so we can check for an error. So if there's an error, what do we do? Well, we log fatal, I guess, if we can call this thing, or, and then we'll do FMT that error, error F, and we'll say add RPC call failed. Well, call is redundant, remote procedure call failed. And percent V, this is the error message it failed on. That's the error message we got. All right. So <laughs> we've sort of flushed out the call to our server. 
but we haven't made a connection yet. If you remember the picture I showed you, I said your clients would be able to send these messages for, for our proto buff over some transport. The transport here is how do you transform or move messages between client and server? And that's this connection. So for that, we want a gRPC connection. And so if we hover over this, it tells us that what we want is a gRPC connection. Um, it doesn't say it now, but client connection. So what we're going to do is create a gRPC connection. And the way we get a gRPC connection is we have to dial the server to get a connection, right? And so if you remember net.dial, it looks something like that. With the net.dial, if I save this, if we do net.dial, what we get? We give it some address and um, the network string and address and all this. So the network is like, um, is it TCP and so on, right? See, no networks. And then the address is like the host and port, this guy over here. And then it returns, ah, oh, geez, I keep moving over it. Uh, and then it returns a connection and an error. So the gRPC dial looks all the same way, except if you, instead of using gR, um, net, use gRPC. And if I save this, see, substitute and pull in gRPC for me. And then if I look at dial, you'll see target and those dial options instead. And it returns a client connection, which is exactly what this requires, a pointer to a client connection. So what we're passing there as C-O-N-N, that's what we get back from here. And there's an error that is going to be returned. And so now we just need to pass to this, the, let's see, the target, which is where you're connecting to. That'll create a client connection to the given target, which is the gRPC server. Our gRPC server is going to be running, running on our local host. So let's store that in a, lake, a variable. Let's call it var, um, maybe something like um, server equals to uh, local host colon port 8080, right? And so this is going to be our target is that server. And the options here, let's just say up. Now ops is really a variadic parameter. So it's multiple parameter instead of really one. So uh, if we call this ops, we should probably um, do something like that to spread out, spread it out as opposed to having to pass option one, two, and three, which means this is a slice. So we can extend a slice like this, pass as a variadic parameter. So we could say var ops is what? It's, let's go back here and see. It's gRPC dial option, okay? So it's a slice of gRPC dial option. So there we go. And for now, we're going to ignore what the dial options are. We're just going to say it how we have empty slice, we expand it, and, you know, we're going to pass that to our dial option. And so what is missing here? Let's see here. Um, result, declare, and not use. Oh, well, yep, we got our result, but we didn't do anything with it. So if we don't have an error, let's print out our result, right? And so we have the add function, which took this parameter and the result was percent V, which was this. So in was what we sent and we got back result. So if we are able to print this out, we should see that what we got past the add was 11 and four and we should expect 15 back as our result. Now again, we do not have a server yet, but this is our client. If you think about, if I had written a function call, you know, function add that took, you know, let's say in there's a pointer to model that, you know, mat request and returns, you know, pointer, uh, pointer model that math response and some error it would sort of look exactly like what we call here right except that this method now is attached this is a method attached to an object whereas this would just be a function and of course if i wanted to i could just attach it to an object so um, it's not very difficult what we had to do is simply get a new client and call it all right um, of course in order to get a new client we had to make a connection to a server somewhere. And to call ours, we, we pass in a context. 
Now you don't have to worry about how the context is being used on the remote end. It just means that now we have a context that we pass in. We can do the same thing that we did before, which is if we make this call and it's taking too long, we can do the same type of thing as you know a timeout context or a deadline context, all the same thing that we covered before. And that's why we cover it because now you can see we could pass in a context to this call and we could cancel it if we use we're using cancellation or deadline or timeout. All right, so that's it. Let's see if we can build. Let's go back up now. Oh, while we're here, let's install our model. So we should do go install mss.model. Let's see if we can build and install that. And that did not work. Okay, let's do, oh, MMS. I did the wrong thing. MMS. And oh, that works. So that's great. Let's go to our client directory then. And let's do go build. And yep, our client build successful. We have an executable. Let's try to run it. And when we try to run it, we have something invalid memory address, nil. Ugh, where is this coming from? And so let's see here. We're being invoked with a client. Oh, a couple of things we should do. Since we dial the server, we did not check and handle this error. So we should totally do that before we go ahead and try and create a client. So we should do if there's an error, if error, error. What should we do? Log that fatal, which is if we cannot establish a connection to our server, connect to grpc server, right? Or service, right? However you want to do it, up to you. And this is the reason why we cannot connect to that service and it's because of this error and because we log fatal we don't have to worry about a program continuing because there's nothing else to do if we can connect to the grpc service but if we have a connection we should defer closing that connection when we're finished so that still remains true when you have any kind of connection so now let's try and rerun this the reason why we fail is because our connection here was nil why was it nil because this dial fail, and so we had a nil value that we tried to register with or create a new client with. So let's clean up, let's rerun, let's rebuild, and then let's rerun our client. And notice how we don't have that nil error, but we do have that error message that we just created there, which is we couldn't connect to this gRPC server, and it says no transport security set. Use gRPC with insecure. Okay, so with gRPC, by default, it wants to use TLS or transport level security. And that just simply means you might see it other places as HTTPS or be previously known as SSL. So we're not going for now going to worry about getting a certificate, registering, loading it, loading it and all this other stuff for a client or a server. We'll do that towards the end of this section. But we do want to write secure services because we're going to put it out on the internet. But for now, getting started, we'll simply restrict ourselves to not use to insecure. So for that, if we need to say dial, we need to say with dial option and dial option that tell us to use gRPC. Well, it didn't say dial option, but I say use gRPC with insecure. So let's just see what that is. So if we put gRPC that with insecure, this guy, you can see it's a function call that doesn't take any parameters and it returns something. And what does it return? It returns this dial option. Well, look at that. We have a slice for dial option or convenient, all right? So we're going to say OPS, OPTS is equals to append because it's a slice onto OPTS, this dial option. So whatever we got back from here. So we'll, or this dial option, we don't care how gRPC with insecure configure this dial option um, thing, but once it does, good. That's all we need to pass. It's telling us to pass it. Let's see if we can do that. So now we have one dial option, which is with insecure. And as you notice, just when I was typing that out, there was with gRPC with, there were a bunch of other ones, right? Like gRPC with, and then there's with authority, with back off configuration, with all this other stuff, with balancer and chain and all this stuff, stuff right? Like crazy stuff. We're not going to get into all that though. And now I save it. I go back here. I build. I rerun. And bam, notice how this message is different. It says that all sub connections are in transient failure. 
latest connection error, yada, yada, yada. The end part here is the real thing. It says connection refuse. Connection refuse makes sense because we do not have a gRPC service. Now, if you want to do something stupid, crazy, you could do this. We can say, let's do nc minus listen, and then let's do local. Well, we have to specify local host, uh, but let's do listen local host 8080. And uh, does that think is like this? There we go. And so this guy is listening. <laughs> Um, on port 8080, but it's not a gRPC service um, server, so or service. And so if we rerun this, you can see it. Oh, yes, our thing is trying to make a connection on HTTP2. It's Samsung message, and it's waiting for a response from here. And you know, I don't even know what the correct response is supposed to be, but you know, yep, connection closes. So it did not say connection refused because we were able to make a connection but it did not get um, whatever message or data it expected back. So, okay, okie dokie, we're making progress. So I close that. All right, so let's move on now to example three. So we have our client in place. It's good, it worked, it seems to be working. At least the client is doing what it's expected. It's trying to make a connection to the server. We didn't have to worry about all that good stuff. So we can assume that how it would work once it is a server out there. And I want to paste it back. So once we do that, now we have exercise three. I'm going to very, very slow because um, since this might be your first time, I want to make sure that you get it. So here we go. Let's create now our server. So we're going to go main, let go, and same thing, package main, function main, main, and then what do we want to do on the server side? Well, for the server, um, I would probably want to start with how the server um, implements the, the detail for being a gRPC service. And so for that, if you remember, when I look at this generated file here, for example, there was this my mat service, service type, right? It's just an interface. And I said, this is the thing that we have to implement. And this is it, the API or the application programmable interface for a service. So this is the thing we need to implement. So how do we implement this? Well, first of all, this is the function we need to implement. So I'll jump back over here. And I'll, for now, I'll put the implementation in a separate file. So I'll create a file called mat.service.go. And of course, it belongs to the package main. And let's start implementing. So we have a type and let's call it my mat mat service. Okay. And it's a struct. That's how we usually use a type to implement, right? We can do a type of anything. We can type on an int or whatever. But for now, I'm gonna use a struct as a type. I don't really need to put anything else in the struct for now, but that's my type. And so I want to implement this interface. Well, it's a function. We have to, that's how our methods are. And so how do we do it? So we say func and it's parameterized on my mat service. Let's call it my mat service. Uh, no, I don't want to do that because I'll have some imports to that my man match that. So let's just call it mat service that and my mat service, right? So this is me attaching this function to a type and that makes it a method and because our interface here my mat server service server has this one method with the exact same signature it also means that i've implemented this interface now i have an error here because this is supposed to be that model and then this guy is going to be that model model that all right because it's another package and so notice how that's been brought in from mmss module and our context again um, is being passed in. This would be how we talk about how context can traverse or cross over process boundary, API boundaries and all that stuff. Well, same thing if somebody, um, the client had a timeout um, context and they send that and I was taking too long and it get canceled or it timeout it expired. Well, then that information will be passed on to me to tell me I have to cancel, right? So we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to simply look at 
what does it mean to implement add? Well, we have this that's coming in. Let's call it in. Let's call this CTX. And so we have what's coming in is the request. So let's do this. I would say we should check and make sure that our, this is not null. If this is null, there's nothing for us to do. So now that we've done all our error checking, how do we actually do any work? Well, it seems pretty simple to me. What we need is to return a result that is a point of value to model that mat response, All right? So let's create that and let's return it. Result and no error, because at this point we assume that everything is hunky dory. How do we populate our result? Well, result that, remember it has this result field. So it's equals to what? In that operand one, we can use get or whatever, but we do an addition. So we do in that operand two, there we go. We don't have to use get right now. We'll deal with when to use get later. And so there we go. That's as, that's how hard it is. Again, if you ignore this old error handling, if we had written a function called add and we took this as a parameter and we had to return the result, this is all we would have to do. And so that's exactly what we did here. We didn't do anything gRPC related here. Nothing. All that is taken care of us from the um, gRPC layer. And so our server is simply have to implement this interface. So notice this is what I use. This is the object I use or the type I use to implement my server interface. So now I can go back to main and let's again cheat a little bit. Um, we can do it a number of ways. I can go to, let's go up. Let's go to example three. And I want to go to the model directory and I'll do go doc. And as you can see, as this function here called register my service, and it says, I expect, just notice how the one to create a new client has this gRPC connection, and then it returns a client that we could use, and that's what we use to write our client. Here we, we have this one, which I'll copy, called register my mat servers server, and it takes a gRPC server and a, this is that interface that's defined. Right, so we can see it here, interface. So any object that or value that implements this interface, which we have just done. So I can type mod, model that, this guy, there you go, save it, it's import that. And so we need a server. So let's call it server, for example. Um, and then da, 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 we need to register our server. So we will give it a pointer to my math service, right? So this is a value that implements that interface as expected. So that's good. What does it return? Well, it doesn't actually return anything, nothing at all. It just expects a server. So what's the server it's expected? So it's expecting a gRPC that server. So if we do save, we can see it out this gRPC server. And this is a struct. Well, we don't want to populate all these things inside of the struct. So I would suggest that we look for something else to call. And so there's an address and blah, 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 balancer configuration, all this other stuff and long line of thing. But look at it, new connection stream, new this, new that, new server. Ah, this looks promising. If we do new server and we look, it returns pointer to service, to server, which is good then we can serve, save that here as server. And now we can pass that in, because that's exactly what we need to pass in here, point it to a gRPC server. And this guy takes some options also, notice it's variadic parameters on gRPC server. So op server option. So I'll take that out. Uh, let me do this first. I'll take this out from here move it up to over there and I'll say, okay, variadic parameter on options. Let's do the same thing as we did before. Var OPTS is a slice of server option. That takes care of that, right? Now, if we were concerned, remember in our client, we said that we use an insecure connection. If we were not doing insecure connection, we'll at this point before we create our server, 
we would configure TLS, right? So we configure TLS and all this other stuff or whatever else we need to do, load balance or all this other stuff. I don't know. We'll just configure it here in our server option, create server options to represent those different things. And then we create our server with those different options. But we don't need to do that. So what is the last thing that we have to do? Well, we, let's see, what else do we have? Oh, so we have server option. And what we need to do though is now we have a server. We need to listen for client connection and we those client when we hear those client connection come in well we have to serve them so we should after we s register and all that stuff we do server that serve and if you look at this it says server accept incoming connection on the listener ls it created a new server transport and service go routine uh, this stuff save going away go routine for each the server go routine reads the grpc request and then call the register handler to reply to them server returns um, when listener accept fails with a fatal error listener will be closed when the method returns so all that stuff just basically says this is how we serve our clients but to serve our clients we need a listener to listen on so let's call this ls lis and so the only thing left to do is create a listener. So how do you get a listener? Well, net that listen. If you remember this guy, we can create a listener, uh, LISD and listen. And so if I save this, we can see that out here, we can pass, as I mentioned before, just like dial, remember the dial function? Oh, it gives us a connection, but dial is from the point of view of the client connecting out to a server, but the server would always do a listen it has to listen for client connection. And so we're listening to the network type again, which is gonna be TCP and the address. So we're listening to TCP and the address here is going to be, let's do um, call this address. And so our address is going to be some variable. We're gonna call it a address equals to, um, let's call it local host colon 8080. Okay, now we can make this a parameter to our function um, so that we can change the address just in case there's an issue. We can fix that in the very next ex um, code example. So um, let's just go ahead and make this work. So now that we have a listener, remember it's going to restart a listener or an error because we might fail to listen on that port. And there's the error we got. All right, we've created a new gRPC server register our service implementation. We are listening on an address and we're gonna start serving gRPC, um, RPC, remote procedure call on that address. So now let's go to our server directory. We do go build and that builds successfully. If we then run this, it's going to wait there we open up this guy. Remember, we already have a client, right? In our client directory. Which directory are we in? So let's go back up one. We already have a client. So if we do client, I come on, client. Oh, geez, so it's client, client, and we run it. There we go. Result is 15. Very, very easy. It was so simple that you probably not don't even think that this actually worked. Like, did we actually send this to a server? Well, let's see, let's kill our server here and let's rerun our client and see, and it fails of course, because we are sending it to that server and our server is waiting there and we send it. And it's this easy. How hard was this? All this other stuff that we did in the server side, this is just creating a socket to listen on. We listen on it and we create a gRPC server and we register the implementation that we have. So from now on, in our next example, we can grow and change what our service is doing, and we don't have to come back to any of this. So let's do that. And that's gonna be the last and final example. So let's stop this guy. And for now, I'll close this here. And let's close up example three, copy it. I'll close all these files we were working with, and I'll select here, paste it. And let's call it example four. And we'll go over here and let's start with something simple that has nothing to do with gRPC. So I will 
instead of um, hard coding this, I'll use the flags package so that we can do flags that part flag that parse for example to parse the flag package. But also I need to register a flag option. So I'll say flag that string var and we'll say we want this to be um, the variable that we're going to store something in and the name of this is we're going to call it s for server and then the value we're going to use is this default value which you can read from there and the use this is grpc server address in the form of host colon port that's going to be like our help string and so we'll parse that and then if somebody doesn't provide anything it's going to use this that we already have and so this is super super easy and I can do the same thing in our server. So for a server, I'll paste this and instead of so save, instead of saying S, I'll say this is the we want to listen. So our address actually, let's do A for address and this grpc local address. Ah, let me, it would help if I spell these things correctly. So address, so we go back here and then we want to have a variable we have that there and here we're going to use address and address okay so this is where the server listen and over here this is where the client connects as to the server all right so that's that so that's really doesn't have anything to do with grpc i said we're going to extend our grpc service so let's start with the model how are we going to extend it let's go to proto and now that we're doing add, why don't we do a few other things? For example, we can do subtraction. And subtraction takes the same thing. The same math request represents all the information we need for subtraction. If we were doing something different, like let's say we we're doing just negate, then this might not be the, the we might have to complete a new message because at that point all we need is the number that we need to negate. We don't need to send two operands, just one. So that would be a unary operation instead of a binary operation. So we can, with these set of messages, support any binary operation, that mad binary operation we know. And so we know a couple, subtraction, multiplication, we know division, and we can also do the modulus, right? Um, of course, there are others, power and all this other stuff, but let's stop there. Just wanna show you that how, how easy it is to actually extend your service. Um, so now this is our gRPC message, so we should totally go generate you know, regenerate this so that oh, we have um, a client that can call those other functions and of course a server that um, exposes them. And so if we do the same thing, proto, and we rerun this, oh, of course I wanna be up four, um, exercise four, and then um, now we're in exercise four directory, I could rerun proto and remember I'm saying, I want to use a message that pro messages that proto from this model directory or include this model directory as a place to look for files and there's a file I want to encode. And then I want to run to the gRPC server using the gRPC plugin and I want to generate Go code and there you go. And as you can see, my client interface has been updated and the implementation for me to be able to call all these methods from the client side. And for the server, the server interface is already updated saying that oh, I need to implement these messages on the server. And so that's all we need to do for the gRPC side. I'm gonna minimize this, close this. And if we go back to the client code, well, we wanna be able to, let me just close this for a second. We wanna be able to call these additional, um, you know, additional functions. So we call, here we have a client and we call just, um, grpc uh, we just call it add so it seems to me that once we have a context and we have the message we want to send what we can do is just let's do this let's call this function um call it test mat service and now that we have a client now we can call our function so um this was for the add call and we can say test mat service and pass it the client right so i haven't changed anything really i just sort of wrap up the function call to the the part that calls the our service we i just put in a function so 
I can reuse this set of call like this. I can say, let's just do add call. Um, not add call, but rather a subtraction call. So I'll select this and I'll do some little bit of cheating by saying we're doing the subtraction call. And now my client should be able to do this. Now this is complaining. It's saying that this is not new variable, so I should get rid of that. All right, so this is the call to subtract. Let's do a call to multiply. Multiply, there we go. And let's do a call to divide. Dab, dab, dab. And that's going to be divide. And the last API we have on our mat server is our mat service is modulus mod mod. So, all right, this is pretty straightforward. Call it, print out the result. That's it. If you get an error, well, block fatal. Well, we don't have to be that brutal about it, but we'll leave it anyway. We don't expect any error. On the server side, we don't have to do anything with this part because remember, this part is just listening, setting up our service to listen and registering the implementation for a service. So all we have to do, do is go over here and implement these other functions. And so these guys are pretty straightforward. I'll just push things down. And so the one we want to implement is this guy. So let's do that. So select this and we want to implement sub subtraction. Now for subtraction, we don't have to take any kind of precaution. So that's just subtraction. That's straightforward. What about multiplication? Let's select that. That ah, too much. That that. So we're doing subtraction. Ah, multiplication. Multiplication again. We don't have to take any precaution. We just do the multiply, and we're good. Push that down. What about division? That that. So division. Well. What happens if we divide by zero? That's a problem. So we want to take do one other test. And so that's that. Okay, the only other one that we need to um, take care of is modulus. And modulus is a form of division that sort of returns the remainder as a whole number. So um, we can essentially leave that test in place. And so mod, that works fine. To, to have that second test, but instead of doing divide, we're doing the modulus operation, which in Go is a percent sign. And that's it. That's how we extend our math service. The only thing left to do now is to sort of build these things. So let's open up our terminal again, and I'll clean up. We're in exercise four directory. Let's um, install or rebuild our um, Let's see, is it going to work if we do to go to client and we do go build? Nice, it builds this for us. It means it's updated our um, definition. And let's do server and let's do go build server also. Let's start our server running. So server. And then let's open up a directory here. CD, da da da. We want to go to the client directory. Uh, let's do the client and we can see all those operations. So if you remember, we did 11, 4, addition, 15, subtraction is 7, modification, 44, and we do division, and we do the modulus operation. There is our full server working as before. And we also added the nice little thing that if you wanted to, you can override the port. So if your server is running somewhere else, you don't have to use local port. You can put it on another um, host and you could have the server register to listen on some other IP address also by specifying, you know, um, whatever what address it should listen on. Okay, so that is it. I think that's enough. I uh, went through this very, very slowly. In the next video, uh, we'll do streaming in the next part of this, and then we'll build on it and keep going, and then eventually we'll add security towards the end of this um, section. If you haven't hit the subscribe button yet and you like what you're seeing, please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell so you can notify when I post videos and spread the word. So if you like what you see, please help me grow the channel. Take care. 
have a great day bye